So the current MBA admissions climate, what's going on right now in the MBA admissions world? Well, I have to look back a little bit here. Um, there was a bit of a bubble building in 2007, 2008. So we're looking back a, a few admission cycles now, almost four admission cycles. You're seeing Harvard Business School with a 15% increase overall, Tuck with 15%, Wharton 20%. Schools were seeing, you know, MIT 30%. You were seeing big, big increases in application volume. And there was, I think, kind of a sense of, among those on the inside of investment banks that there was a, a financial bubble building and it was time to move on. So some people were being proactive. At the same time, the bubble had it burst. There were huge bonuses being doled out. And some people in the first round were also were still seeking uh, to, to get into business school. You, you had international applicants increasing because there was a lot of cheap credit out there. So it was easy to finance educate, uh, one's education. And uh, there were plentiful jobs because baby boomers, the good times were on, and some of them were retiring. Well, in 2008, 2009, as I'm sure most of you know, 2008, you know, the bubble started to burst. 2008, 2009, we started to see application volume really swell at the beginning of the year. In fact, at Harvard Business School, their former dean now uh, said that round one was the highest volume they'd ever seen and the highest quality of applicants they'd ever seen, except that they were down 5% overall compared to 2007, 2008. So there was a lot of built-up demand from people who are still being laid off after the bubble who didn't, had not yet found their home and thought, okay, business school is the way to go. All those people applied in the first round. Uh, the first round being October, and they were down 5% overall. Uh, MIT, same thing, record volume, but was down in round two. Tuck said their application volume was flat. And you started to see applicants becoming a little more cautious. I have a job. Do I want to go and take that risk of getting an MBA and coming out without a job? Um, there, were, there was a difficulty for internationals in obtaining student loans. A lot of schools canceled their student loan programs. Um, and that's something that has subsequently reversed itself. And a lot of baby boomers weren't going anywhere, so jobs were tough to get. Um, as you look towards the, 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 the coming, the, the following years, 2009, 2010, there were mixed reports on application volumes. I don't know if Eric, if you recall, but I actually wrote an article uh, on your site talking about how I thought that volumes were going to decrease a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, and sure enough, that was borne out by uh, by by application volumes. 2009, 2010, several schools, some schools were still reporting, you know, that they were they were flat or maybe a, a little bit up, but overall, um, a lot of schools were down, and it had to do with the difficult employment climate. So now we're in 2010, 2011. We thought that this was a great year to be applying because the job market is is improving. But application volumes, at least on a localized level, sure, you know, they're not, they're not down um, the way they were in, say, 2005, 2006. Um, you know, we're, we're off of a peak, but we're not quite in, in a valley. Um, but in on a localized level, we feel that, uh, that you know, this was a, with, with application volumes decreasing and the job picture improving, someone who's going to graduate in 2013, uh, 2000, you know, 2013 and now this coming year, 2014, um, are probably in a good position to be applying and going to school and coming out when the job picture is better. It's not robust right now, uh, but banks are certainly back on campus. Consulting firms are back on campus. Technology firms really never left. And uh, it, we think it's a good time to be applying. Obviously, you know, we're not a... Uh, we're not a team of macro uh, economists, but you know you have to make your own your own decision in terms of what the job picture is going to look like. Uh, but we think that now is is a is a pretty good time to be applying. So let's talk about creating your long-term plan. Uh, you know, there's no time like the present. We don't mean that in terms of applying. We mean that in terms of preparing yourself for the coming year if you are going to apply. So what are schools looking for? This is, you know, people always say, what are schools, what's, what's, what's Harvard looking for? You know, what's Wharton looking for? What's Stanford looking for? They're not looking for one thing. Um, and that's something to, that I'd like to address maybe before we go further. You know, the schools aren't looking, there isn't a magical, you know, if you have a 3.9 GPA and a 750 GMAT score and you worked at McKinsey, you get into Wharton. It doesn't work that way. Um, you know, there isn't a, a recipe and that's why the schools are, are combing the world. They're going to all, you know, all sorts of 
interesting places to find the best candidates. And if they just had a simple formula, they would post it on their website. But what are some of the what are some of the things that the schools value? Well, certainly academic abilities. They need to know that you need that you can manage the rigors of an academic course load. Um, they look at your undergraduate grades, but not just your grades. A, a 3.2 from uh, the University of Illinois Engineering School, you know, that's that's a that's a solid GPA from that school. Um, you know, a 3. Point, uh, 3.75 from um, you know, from Northwestern's journalism program is, 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 a, is a solid grade as well. But how do you equate those two? So they start to look at rigor and not, not just the, the, the hard score. Um, and they want to know that you can manage a quantitative score. They want to know that, that you can manage a quantitative course load. So they start to look at your GMAT scores. And we'll talk a little bit about what makes a strong GMAT score. Additionally, um, you know, the, the schools will look at your, uh, you know, at other factors like the quantitative nature of your coursework. If you're a research analyst, if you are uh, in heavily analytical marketing, uh, if you are in an investment maker, if you've taken uh, designations like the CFA or your accountancy designation, these are things the schools look at. Now, a lot of you, I mean, we're on a site called Beat the GMAT, are going to spend all of your time worrying about the GMAT. Now, the GMAT is important, and we'll talk about this a little bit more. But you should know that Wharton sent out a um, sent out a, a, a PowerPoint presentation to its alumni, uh, its alumni interviewers, where they said, I believe I could be a little bit off. I believe they said 70% of their applicants were statistically admissible. So you need to have a little bit more. Um, and so they start to look, you know, your 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 scores alone. It's not like um, the IIT entrance exam, where if you get a certain grade, you're in. You need to have a lot more when it comes to business school. And so they start to look at your leadership experience and potential. And the schools say, okay, you know, do, what, what, what has your professional trajectory been like? It doesn't necessarily mean how many promotions have you earned, but, you know, you could be part of a flat organization. So maybe they start to say, okay, how much responsibility have you gained? Um, what, are your, what are your recommenders saying about you? How do you, you know, how can you show that you've increased your responsibility? Your community activities. Hmm, you know, maybe if you haven't had that much leadership opportunity at work, you've just done your job exceptionally well. Well, maybe you've been involved in your community and you've shown leadership. Maybe you're driven personally. So the schools say, okay, you know, academic abilities, maybe a bit of a first cut, although we certainly see candidates with with scores in the 500s get in every year. Um, but, you know, adding on to that leadership skills and then interpersonal skills. You can have a, a you can have great grades and, and, a, and a great, uh, you know, great GMAT score and you could have a series of promotions. And if, the, if they don't feel like you can work well uh, in, a, in a learning team, you're going to contribute nicely in a classroom, you're going to be a, an enjoyable part of their, uh, of their community, it probably suggests you're not going to be a very good manager. So, um, so they want to know that you have the interpersonal skills necessary to contribute to the community and the classroom. And then diversity and international experience. Now, diversity is a bit of a loaded word. I mean, I, I think diversity isn't just um, you know, gender diversity or national diversity, although that, that can help. Um, but it's also sort of a, uh, you know, I'll switch into French here, a little uh, je ne sais quoi, a little, a little intangible. You know, what do you bring to the class? What do you, what do you offer by, in terms of life experience that maybe others don't offer? Um, and then mutual fit with your target program. And this is something where you can have the first four of these things, but if you don't know that program well, and if you're in, in an interview and you're not able to speak intelligently about why you're there, about what you want to get out of that program academically, where you think you can contribute, uh, you know, in terms of clubs and social activities, they're going to realize that you're not – you haven't done your homework and you're not that serious about them. So this is these on a, on a very, very basic level. These are five fundamentals that the schools are looking for. I don't think they've got a checkbox. It's just it's part of their evaluation process, uh, most likely uh, subtly as opposed to explicitly. So what are your next steps? If you're looking uh, at your academic abilities, certainly prepare for the GMAT. Now, um, some of you might not know that the – essay questions come out for next year's first round in in May. So if you're looking at taking a nine-week class and most you know, you know, Manhattan GMAT classes, the vast majority of them are nine-week classes. Uh, they recommend four weeks of study. If you enroll now, today, like literally when we get off this, off this webinar, 
you're looking at a May 30th test. So you're already, your GMAT is already encroaching on your application year. And that's why, again, long-term planning, good idea. You know, you don't want to leave that for another six weeks or another two months. Then you're looking at July in terms of taking your test. What if you don't do well? Maybe you need to take the, take, take the test a second time. And admissions officers will, will encourage you to take the GMAT two or three times if, you, if you're not getting the score that you think is you know, your, your maximum score because the test is computer adaptive. And without going into it too much, what it means is the test will find your optimal, uh, your, your, your strongest performance. The test will continue to adapt and test you at a higher level. And so you can't really accidentally get a 730 GMAT score because they're going to keep giving you tougher questions and you're going to have to start consistently getting it right at the 730 level. And so you can't, because you can't, um, you can't have a fluky high score, the, the school recognizes that your highest score is actually an indication of your best performance. So if you're looking at taking, signing up today, May 30th, well, okay, that's the first test. If you don't do well, we're, you know, we're looking at June, then we're looking at July. So certainly if you're, if you're planning on a, a solid long-term plan, it start it, you know, enroll in a class and start studying. What should your target score be for the GMAT? Well, what's generally considered to be a safe score is a 700 score with an 80th percentile, 80th percentile on both sides of the test. Now, does that mean you must have that score to get in? No. If you have a 75th percentile, are you done? No. If you have a 70th percentile, no. But you might have to start looking at other ways to make an impression. For me, I was a speechwriter, as Eric said. I hadn't taken a quantitative class since, uh, since high school. Maybe a 70th percentile score is a challenge for me. Maybe it's not for uh, you know, an investment banker who had, taken, had earned A's in calculus or statistics as an undergrad and has been working with numbers his entire career. So you need to say, okay, these are guideposts, but they're not, um, you know, they're not, they're not rules. So speaking of that, speaking of uh, you know, maybe, you, maybe you haven't taken a quant class in a long time. You have the time now to, uh, to bolster your academic profile. It's going to be tough to take a you know, winter course right now. You might take uh, you know, the very end. There might be a, a, a crash weekend-long session. I, I guess I think we're now in the, in the, uh, in the first day of spring anyway. Um, but we're looking at spring courses right now. If you have a poor academic performance, I would say that's anything under a 3.0. You're probably, if you're, if you're competing in a top school, you're probably going to be looking at, uh, you're, you're probably going to want to take an additional uh, course or two to say, look, I've matured, I've grown. I'm not the college kid who had a 2.9 GPA. Uh, that was the kid who didn't understand how important it is to, uh, to perform academically. So, if, again, if you have low grades, definitely take some, and you're serious about your, your MBA applications, definitely take, you know, or strongly consider taking uh, a course or two in calculus, statistics, economics, finance, or accounting. Calculus, statistics, and economics are really, they are the, um, the classes that really show raw intellectual horsepower, more so than finance and accounting, which, which reveal um, the ability to, to manage a, um, you know, a, a certain kind of skill as opposed to, again, just the, the brain power. But finance and accounting can be acceptable as well. Um, but again, you know, if you're like me, if you haven't taken, you've done okay on the GMAT, but you haven't taken a, a, a math class in a long time, even if you have a strong GPA, even if you have a 3.8, but it's in uh, English literature, well, you might want to consider taking a test, as, taking, a, uh, taking a, a class or two as well. Um, I, I, because I'm in New York, I should have bias towards New York, but you can go to NYU, but you can also go to Baruch or Fordham or Rutgers or Pace. It doesn't really matter. You can go to a community college. They want to know that the, the classes, the, the admissions officers want to know the class is real. You don't need to go to, if you went to Columbia, you don't need to go back to Columbia for your, um, for your, your, uh, your additional coursework. You just need to go to a reputable institution and, uh, and prove your chops. Uh, what constitutes a good GPA? I would say, you know, the average is around a 3.5. You're not in trouble if you have a 3.4 or a 3.3. You know, the nature of an average is that someone's above average and someone's below average. But you know, generally, a you know 3.5 is is a pretty safe GPA. Moving on to uh, some of the other factors outside the quantitative area. So, engaging in community and leadership activities. Um, 
you know, it's important to – it's not important – the schools are not puritanical where they're saying, okay, everyone must do three hours a week in order to get into our school or five hours a week. You know, you need to have community service. But it's a way – excuse me. It's a way to, to, uh, to, to differentiate. Everyone's got their grades. Everyone has their GMAT score. Everyone has their work experience. So here's, here's, here's an opportunity for you to offer something new, something different about yourself. But community service is not a sentence – it is an opportunity for you to reveal that you're passionate about something and that you've had impact. And that's the part that a lot of people miss. Okay, there's, a, there's a, um, uh, an old folks home around the corner. I'm going, to, I'm going to go volunteer there. Well, if you're not committed, if you're not passionate about the elderly, hmm, probably not a good idea. If you're just going to sit there for a couple of hours every Sunday, you're not going to have a story to tell. But a story might develop organically. If you go there and you're really committed to it, hmm, you know, maybe you have a talent with an instrument and you start to perform concerts. And the next thing you know, you've got a little band together and, and, uh, and you're, you've got a growing following and you go to other, uh, other senior citizens' homes and you play on weekends. And I'm just making it up. It might be a silly example, but it's the story you can't, you can't create. You can't say to yourself right now, I don't want the 50 people that are listening to all start bands tomorrow and start going to senior citizens' home. It's not a recipe to get in, but it's an opportunity if you're passionate about something to um, – you know, to, to, to reveal that passion and to, and to show, uh, you know, a bit, it's a point of differentiation for you. Now, most people say, hmm, I think it's too late, though. I mean, aren't they going to see through this? Isn't the admissions committee going to say, well, I mean, come on, this guy just started seven months ago. And it's true. If you just start serving time now, if, if you're following sort of the, you know, if it's a prison sentence, you're right. It is too late. Um, but if you are... You know, going into your work committed and you have that impact, if you actually did start that band and that band's been playing and people are rallying around it, et cetera, then it's a story that is going to, if you can show impact over the course of seven months, no one's going to doubt. We had a candidate a couple of years ago who unfortunately had a relative who was ill and he started to, uh, to, to volunteer at the hospital and put together a bit of a fundraising initiative and it was successful and other people started to roll out that fundraising initiative with him and uh, and he raised a lot of money for the hospital and then he was asked to join the charitable board. The whole thing happened over the course of about three or four months and he would ask, isn't this going to look silly? And the answer is no, because you've done so much and the impact is so obvious. No one would assume that you would start this initiative just to impress an admissions committee. Do you have enough leadership experience? It's not something where you can count it and say, okay, I've got, you know, I've got three different activities that should do it. It's all about impact. Advancing personal goals. Now this is an aspect of the process that's fully in your control. You can advance your personal goals on a day-to-day -day basis. You don't need to wait for someone else to give you an opportunity. This is a place where you can own your story. No one else can tell the same story as you on a personal level. So um, sure, you know, there, there are some things like, let's say the CFA, where it's not going to be a dramatic personal story, but if you'd always planned to take, to take the, the CFA, we're not saying start the CFA now if you've never planned to take it, but we, what we are saying is if you've always planned to take the CFA, make sure you take it this year. Make sure you get it done. If you can run you know, 20 miles and you've always planned to sign up for a marathon, take it now. Don't go out and start running tomorrow. Take the, take the, you know, start, sign up for a marathon. Do it. If you have a poem that's been sitting on your desk for a long time, you've always wanted to have it published, get it published. Again, we're, we're, not, you know, we're, not, we're sending in for publication. We're not saying you, you try and become a poet. So there are aspects of your story that are relevant. The schools want to know about you as more than just a, a manager. They want to know that you're a human being. We had a candidate many years ago who, um, who learned a language in order to read a book that was written by his grandfather and, and relay that story to, 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 the, to the kids of his generation. Now, he didn't do that to impress an admissions committee. He did it because he was interested. No one else is telling that story. It's a unique story. And by virtue of the fact that he's a human being, that you're all human beings, you probably have stories of your own. And so all we're saying is accelerate the timeline for aspects of your candidacy that, um, you know, that, 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 are, that are within your control. And it is indeed relevant. Like I said, you know, the school wants to get to know you as a human being. And then get to know your target programs. 
just taking a drink. Um, there are so many different uh, you know, aspects, characteristics that define a define a, a target program. We actually, if you're in New York, um, we actually are doing a, a, a live presentation this Thursday. You can go to our website uh, and sign up <clears throat> for on on school selection, and we really break down these. What do we have here? One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. We have about nine or ten uh, different uh, different criteria. We break them down and talk about the differences. But let's just look at something as simple as location and how it affects a um, you know a business school environment. If you look at Dartmouth Tuck, uh, which is in Hanover, New Hampshire, which is in a, a very small town, and then you compare that to NYU Stern, which is in the West Village, it's in the in Greenwich Village in New York. Very different locations. Now, I'm not just talking about the fact that at, uh, at NYU Stern, you can walk out and get a great falafel at Mahmoud's, or that at uh, you know, Dartmouth Tuck, you're five minutes away from good skiing. Sure, those are little things that might have an, have an impact on you. But if you think about the location, a lot of people at Dartmouth Tuck are going to uh, – virtually everyone at Dartmouth Tuck is going is to is move to that location and is going to create a community together. You're, you're going to establish entirely new friendships, and very few people in the class, maybe one or two a year, lived in that location prior to starting the academic year. If you look at NYU, a lot of people lived in New York beforehand. They have their work friends. They have their personal friends, from possibly from college as well. And again, it's not knocking NYU. For some of you, you might say, hmm, Dartmouth is intimate. For others, you might say, it's a little overwhelming for me. Uh, for some of you, you'll say NYU. You know, it's great. There are a lot of different uh, outlets for me. I can, I can, uh, you know, I, I don't have to be tied to my to my class at all times. Uh, I can, you know, go on a date and not run into my friends at the at the uh, at the local restaurant. Uh, for others, you can say, mm, you know, I want a tighter knit community. At, at NYU, people are going to live all over the city. Some might live in New Jersey and Hoboken. So you've got a very different environment just defined by location alone. For getting something like class size, where Harvard has 900 people. And Berkeley Haas has 240 people, and how that's how that affects the the, the the community, or teaching method, where you have a case method versus a lecture method. So it's time now to learn about the programs and and make a wise choice. You're going to invest, you know, fifty thousand dollars a year in your education plus living expenses and give up salary. That could be for a lot of you. That could be you know somewhere between three and five hundred thousand dollars in in, uh, in, in income and opportunity cost. So it's a good idea to make the most of, of your education by being in an environment that is right for you. So really start to do your homework now. Taking a look at, at uh, and it's the question, sorry, you know, frequently comes up, you know, well, what do I do to, 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 uh, to learn about these schools? The schools have tremendous resources now. You can, lots of schools, you can uh, sit in on classes online or recorded classes. You, they have campus visit programs. You can talk to alumni. You can talk to current students through ambassadorial programs. Our blog is a factoid every Friday about each school. We have our insider's guides on our website. There's a lot that you can do now to learn about the schools. And I, I, I think it's a real investment in your future. Um, you know, it's a really bad idea, in my opinion, to to spend a couple hundred thousand dollars when you include the opportunity cost and not really know what you're getting. So if you look at um, at these schools, you know, take a look at Chicago Booth and Dartmouth Tuck. You've got so their reputation, you know, maybe somewhat arbitrary. Um, you know, Business Week rankings come and go. Um, you know, both considered to be top schools, I would argue. Location: Chicago, third largest city in the United States, eight million people in the metropolitan area. Hanover, I don't know, maybe 20,000 residents, very different, but also, again, people move to Hanover, um, you know, and together and, be, and forge a community. In Chicago, people will live in Hyde Park near the school, people will live in Millennium Park or the Gold Coast, or even a few in Bucktown or Wrigleyville or Lincoln Park. So your, your, your experience with your classmates is going to be uh, less intense. And again, for some people at Chicago, that's fantastic. Um, your class size, 550 at Chicago. Um, versus 240 at, at, at Tuck, more than double the size. You're probably not going to know your classmates at Chicago. It's probably impossible not to know your classmates at Tuck. You're not going to know all your classmates at Chicago. Teaching method, you're going to have, uh, you know, this sort of goes together, I think, with the core at Chicago. You're going to have a flexible curriculum where people are teaching different, you know, one day you might have a, a, a case class, the next day you might have a lecture. Um, there's no real core curriculum. There are some options within buckets at Chicago. 
Uh, so you're going to have the flexibility from day one to choose your courses. Chicago, you have to have, you have to be prepared. You have to know your, um, you know, know your your uh, where you want to go academically from day one. At Tuck, they're going to make your choices for you. You're going to have one elective in your first year. There's a case emphasis at Tuck. So these are just two schools, but they're dramatically different. I always wonder when people say, "Oh, I want to go to Chicago and I want to go to Tuck." I'm sure there's an argument that can be made, but we'd like to know that you've really done your homework and understand that argument and you're not just choosing the uh, the schools for superficial reasons. So again, you know, I talked about this before, what are some of the ways that you can get to know schools? Um, you know, again, uh, admissions blogs, we have our blog, we have our insider's guides, there are chat boards out there. Be careful with the chat boards on every chat board. Sorry, Eric. There's always, uh, there are always many people masquerading, making people feel bad. Uh, you know, they, everyone has a, a 750 GMAT score, a 3.9 GPA and, and worked at KKR. Um, you know, be, be skeptical. Don't, don't worry. Don't feel like you don't measure up. Uh, but chat boards can be a good place to go. Schools have Q&A sessions live and online. Um, and you can visit campuses now. It's going to be tough to visit campuses in October. Most schools don't uh, start their, um, their class visit programs until after the first round deadlines, which are in October. So if you really want to get that a priori knowledge of the school, which I would recommend you get, do it now before the, before the campus visit programs end. And it's great for you to know your school. It's not just, you don't just get points. In fact, at, at schools like Chicago and Harvard, they say it doesn't matter at all whether you visit uh, in terms of their admissions decision about you. Um, but at, 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 at other schools, they will say, you know, it, it's important to us that you go the extra mile. You come visit a, we're off the beaten path. We want to know that you're really committed to our school. Uh, but even just from, from, for your own uh, your own needs, it's important, and it does make an impression. If you're writing a why our school, uh, why Columbia, um, you know, piece, and you haven't visited, you know, it, you're not going to have a lot to talk about. That kind of personalized essay writing is important. The schools really want to know that you fit. They want to know that you're going to be, uh, you know, a happy, active contributor to the class, and they want to know that you're going to be a happy alumni who's going to be, uh, who's going to be giving them those donations that they look for to keep themselves going. So I would say, you know, really, really focus on that fit piece. So what's going to happen over the next 12 months? Well, let's go. March, right now. Start your GMAT studies. Now is the time. Uh, I wouldn't put it off much longer if you want to have a leisurely first round application. Visit a target school or two or three. Start doing that now if you can. If you're abroad, it's not as necessary, but still reach out and, uh, and try to you know, interact with the school in some way. Um, start to advance your community and personal objectives. And this is another one that I think a lot of people ignore. Pursue firm sponsorship. You don't want to be in a situation where you're asking your firm, come next year, oh, will you sponsor me? A lot of firms, it's bureaucratic. It takes them, uh, we had a couple of Japanese clients over the years where they find out a year and a half before they apply, uh, you know, they, if that, that's when they find out if they're going to have firm sponsorship. Uh, we've seen people have, you know, at smaller firms where they're, where they're valuable and the firm creates a program for them. So it's not the type of thing that you can achieve when you just walk into someone's office one day and say, by the way, I got into business school. Will you sponsor me? So get marching. Bad pun. Um, April, meet with alumni and students. Uh, you know, again, you want to start to, you can't do everything at once, but you want to really get to know your really get to know your target schools. Assess, recommend, assess recommenders and connect with old recommenders. If, you're, if you were a college athlete, if you were in the military, um, if you had a, a venture and, and you had an investor, and this is a couple of years old, generally we don't recommend that you look too far in the past for recommenders, but if you have an old recommender like one of those three that I just suggested, you're going to want to connect because they might be you know, val a valuable recommender for you because what you did with under their watch was formative and they have, they have unique insight into you. You don't want to call that person in September and say, by the way, I need you to write, we haven't talked in three years, I need you to write me six recommendations. You want to start prepping people now. You also want to start assessing these people. If you have someone in your office who applied last year, hmm, what was it like working with our supervisor on my recommendations? Did the person miss deadlines? That's, a, that's a, something you want to be aware of. So do a little bit of uh, reconnaissance and, and understand you know, what kind of 
in, what kind of recommend, you know, you might have the nicest guy who says he's going to be helpful, but if he misses deadlines and doesn't put the time and effort into it, that's a problem. Um, keep visiting target schools, narrow your choices. Look into informational interviews. That's an area where if you're a career changer, they want to know you've done your homework. If you can say, having spoken with, uh, you know, Eric at, uh, at Beat the GMAT, I, I now have a better understanding of what it's like to, uh, to join a, 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 a an upstart, uh, you know, uh, web-based community. You know, I, I, I feel that I can make this transition, dot, dot, dot. You're going to want to show that you know what you're doing, not just saying, okay, I have this goal, it's a fun goal, but that I'm capable of, 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 uh, of implementing in this space. Prepare your resume. A lot of people leave their resume, make it the last thing. I've got a resume, I'll look at it whenever. If you can spend a couple of hours uh, you know, revising your resume and, and having someone look over it and give you feedback and getting it out of the way. You can update it with a few current bullet, bullet points. You know, the past is the past. Your last job isn't going to change. Two jobs ago isn't going to change. You can get uh, a time-consuming piece of the puzzle out of the way. And then in May, hopefully you're taking the GMAT and hopefully you're taking it once. In the meantime, you know, you're, it's time to start applying. You're defining your target list. Um, hopefully you're starting a summer course as well if, you, if, it's, if it's something that, uh, that you need. And then you're going to be you're brainstorming and starting your essay writing. So it's, it's not that far away. June, maybe you're taking that GMAT again. You might be facing midterms in your, in your courses. You're going to continue writing those essays. July, GMAT one last time. You're still advancing your personal agenda. You're still writing those essays. Some things are just ongoing. And then you're going to start meeting with your recommenders and saying, look, you know, we have about uh, you know, a little over two months. You know, I need your help and, and uh, having that pep talk with them. In the MBA Mission Complete Start to Finish Guide, we have a sample recommendation and a sample, we have a, a full, about, I think about 10 pages that are dedicated to recommenders so that they understand the obligations. They're not there to be cheerleaders, they're there to offer thoughtful, um, you know, thoughtful commentary on your strengths and even your weaknesses. You want to have something that's, that's bold and honest um, with clear examples, so you want to prep your recommenders, you don't want to just send them packing and say, okay, write me six letters. Uh, if they become cheerleaders, it could be a problem for you. August, you're completing your coursework. Again, you know, some of these things are implied. You're going to continue writing your, your essays. You're going to continue with your community endeavors and your personal endeavors. And you're going to follow up with your recommenders and make sure that they are on track. September, polish those essays and seek feedback. Uh, whether it's from us, whether you're working with the MBA mission, or you've got a friend who you really trust, um, and, uh, and who is an excellent communicator, uh, you, you're going to want to show those essays to someone. Now, you're not going to want to show them to five people, six people. Eventually, you're going to find someone who doesn't like what you wrote. It's the nature of essays are, you know, that they're a qualitative process. If you show it to two or three people and they, they like it, we'd stop the feedback loop because you're probably going to drive yourself crazy. Um, the one thing that I'd be skeptical of, and I think we wrote a Beat the GMAT We've run a, a series for Beat the GMAT on uh, admissions myths destroyed. and I think it was posted recently. Um, uh, you know, a lot of people have bosses who've been to these schools and they say, well, when I applied to this school, this is what I did. You should do what I did. There are a lot of armchair experts out there. And if your boss got into Wharton in, you know, in 1999, his advice may be out of date. And he probably didn't get in for the reasons that he thought he did. And business schools become far more competitive over the last few years, and uh, you know, we want to try and get you to uh, really think carefully and potentially eschew the advice of, of a boss who may be doing more harm than good. September, you want to harangue those recommenders who uh, you know are not, uh, you know, maybe maybe some of them are not uh, up to speed. We often we often tell people set fake deadlines for your recommenders so that they'll get the job done earlier. Um, and, uh, and then moving to October, you're submitting your round one application. So it's not that far away. You can start, you can visit your remaining schools because class visits open up and maybe like me, take a deep breath and just make sure that, uh, you know, you're, you're back on track for the second round. Now, if you, if you apply for the first round, first round, all things being equal, it's a little bit, I, I, I hasten, I don't want to say better, but, um, you know, it's, it, it, it's not like your chances are so much better in the first round. If you're a strong applicant in the first round, you're going to be a strong applicant in the second round. But the admissions officers are fresh. And, you know, there's something to be said for applying right after someone's had a summer vacation and, you know, maybe has gotten over the fatigue. But one of the nice things about it is you'll start to get your 
your invitation, your interview invitations in November and December, and your, um, you know, you're going to be able to evaluate your progress. Say, okay, you know, maybe I didn't get an interview request at those schools at the end of November. Maybe as I look towards the second round and the ones in January, I might want to adjust. I want to adjust my, my expectations and apply to a few uh, schools that aren't quite as competitive. Or maybe I'm getting a lot of positive feedback. Maybe I'm getting a lot of interview requests. Well, maybe I'm going to look at a, at a more risky choice. So applying early gives you that flexibility. December, you're back in a polishing essays and seeking feedback. You're interviewing with some of your target schools. Um, January, you're submitting your round two applications. Might enjoy an acceptance or two from the first round. Um, you know, you're going to be planning interviews again. And some of you might be looking at wait list letters even. And then February, you're doing things like looking at visas, uh, you know, visa applications, maybe applying for scholarships, reassessing your targets in the second round. Uh, maybe you're looking at things like how to quit your job and, and spend some time on the beach. Um, but, you know, the whole thing you can see is going to happen very, very quickly. And this is a, a you know, two-minute rundown on creating your long-term plan. So what is this session really about? It's really about time management. We, you know, we usually, when we, we've done this, we did this presentation at different times in the year, we really hope that people get their GMAT, their classes out of the way by May. It's more, it's more likely that you're going to, you know, get this stuff done by August. You have about four plus months to start doing the things that are on the left. And you're going to continue working on your, on your, on your, you know, community, acti your community activities and, and your personal accomplishments past August. You know, you don't want to just have a hard cutoff, but you don't want to be, you know, taking your GMAT, visiting campuses, you know, trying to progress in your work life, trying to balance family and social commitments, get firm sponsorship, et cetera, all at the same time starting in August. So the next four plus months, get as much as you can out of the way, manage your time well, and you'll have a far more sane, reasonable life in come August when, uh, when you should really be working on your applications. So with that, I mean, that, that is actually the, the end of the, the meat of our presentation. Um, a little bit of MBA mission. Uh, who are we? We're elite communicators. Uh, I was a speechwriter for the Ambassador of Israel to the United States. Lynn Maloney wrote, uh, was a managing editor for Inc. In, Inc. and Fast Company. Uh, Monica carpenter Oka wrote a book on how to write effective Harvard Business School application essays. We're communicators first. Just because someone has gone to a business school, it doesn't mean they can help you get into that school. It just means they got in. You need to have someone who can help you communicate effectively. We have unique MBA experience. Um, you know, most of our staff went to Harvard for whatever reason. We're not biased towards Harvard. Uh, we have people who have been you know, on admissions committee. We have uh, admissions committees. We have people who have been their class graduation speaker, people who've headed up um, you know, uh, different, uh, different, you know, the entrepreneurial organization, the, the Follies, et cetera. We know business schools well. We're not a website. We're a real firm. There are a lot of admissions websites out there where, you know, the team is not even on the website, or if they are, there are a whole bunch of part-time staff members who, you know, take on a, uh, you know, one, one client a year. That's not us. This is what we do. This is what our team does. And we're very proud of our team. We've had a lot of external validation. Uh, we have a wonderful partnership with Manhattan GMAT. We have an excellent partnership with Kaplan. We have a strong reputation, I, I'd like to think, with, uh, with Beat the GMAT. Um, so, you know, we are, we're offering, I think we've been validated with our book that's in the public, the public domain, available on Amazon.com. Uh, we have a lot of external validation, and uh, it means a lot to us. And we're already working for you. We've written books. We've written insider's guides. We share them with you. They're free. We do presentations like this. We want to show you that we know what we're talking about and we're ready to help you. Um, so that's a little bit about us. Uh, we guide, we typically work with candidates on a complete start to finish basis. Um, I don't want to go too much into this. If you ever want to take us up on a free consultation, the link will be there. Um, certainly we can talk to you about what we do in greater depth. Here are a few members of our team. Like I said, Monica carpenter Oker went to Harvard Business School. She wrote a book on how to write a how to write Harvard Business School application essays with several of her peers at Harvard. Lynn Maloney, Harvard Business School managing editor at Inc. and Fast Company. So, um, you know, we have a, a really really strong staff. Akiva Smith Francis, three Harvard degrees, worked at McKinsey, uh, published author. So, you know, our, our staff is on our website. This isn't it. This is just a small sampling, um, but. Uh, you know, I think you'll, I hope you'll agree that we have a pretty impressive staff of communicators. We really believe that every candidate has a unique story to tell that your story makes the difference. And we have the creative experience to help you tell yours. Um, before I, I finish up here, I mentioned that it's time to start taking the GMAT. 
our, uh, our friends at Manhattan GMAT have a variety of courses that are live online um, that are starting shortly. And so, um, you know, if you're looking to take the GMAT, you can start pretty soon. And uh, I think it'll really help you as you, as you make your, as you start to forge your candidacy for the first round deadlines. Um, and with that, we do a free consultation for, uh, for any applicant. Uh, it's a half an hour. Uh, we do our best to, to provide you with as much help as we can in a free half an hour. Come with questions. We will do our, uh, our best to answer them within that half an hour. And, uh, and you know, we'd love to hear from many of you. So for that.